What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this video I tell you what's on my dividend stock watch list, as well as tell you why a watch list is important to create and how you can make one. So if you appreciate videos about dividends, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. And I recommend you watch this entire video, as I'm also going to respond to a few subscriber comments that were a bit cynical and or angry. Finally, I'll end things with a story that's worth listening to. But first I gotta apologize if my voice sounds off, because I'm fighting the beer virus right now. Also, I just hit 9,500 subscribers on my free dividend Discord that has people on it from over 70 countries around the world. So if you haven't joined it, then I recommend you do so ASAP, because then you can call yourself an OG who joined before I hit 10,000 users. Okay, I wanted to show you this poll I ran on my Twitter and on the community tab of my YouTube channel. In case it wasn't clear, it was just a joke. I asked people to vote on their favorite sin stock, and then I listed Altria due to their SIGs, RCI Hospitality, which is adult entertainment, Brown Foreman, which is a bunch of alcoholic brands, and then as a joke I included Home Depot due to them selling gas stoves. What happened was that in December a report came out that estimated that almost 13% of childhood asthma cases in the US were caused by gas stove use, similar to the level caused by secondhand smoke. So that report led to a bunch of people freaking out that their gas stoves might be outlawed, so I thought it'd be funny to include it as a sin stock. Now could they be banned? Sure, anything could happen. Okay, let's get into the watch list. A watch list is just a bunch of stocks you're thinking you might want to invest in, so you're keeping an eye on them. They usually are companies that you've already analyzed to some degree, and you're waiting until the time is right for you to buy. Like maybe you don't have the cash right now, or maybe the price on the stock you're watching is too high, or maybe you're waiting to sell something before you replace it. Another reason they could be on your watch list is if you want to beef up certain sectors in your portfolio. Like maybe you don't have enough industrial stocks, so you start researching and ultimately watching a few of the best ones that align to your needs. Or maybe you want to raise your portfolio's overall CAGR, as well as get some more industrials representation, so you look for high dividend CAGR industrial stocks. I actually have a tool in beta in my spreadsheet product that my Patreon aristocrats and kings have access to, which allows you to search for different types of stocks. Like let's say you want to find stocks that have at least a 3% yield, a 10% dividend CAGR, and are in the industrial sector. You hit search, and this identifies a few you could dig into. Now some people maintain a watch list because they day trade, but that goes against my style of investing, which is simply buy good stuff, ideally when it's cheap, and then keep holding it as long as it makes sense, potentially forever. Some people create watch lists of alternative portfolios so they can compare how their portfolio is doing against something else. There is no defined standard way to build a watch list, as some people go the simple route and just check out the stock price every so often, and other people get more elaborate and use dashboards, either from spreadsheets they create or from their own brokerage. Many brokerages allow you to easily create and view multiple watch lists. Like Fidelity is my main brokerage where I keep my dividend stocks, and they let you create up to 15 watch lists of up to 50 tickers each. On a browser you log into Fidelity, then go to News and Research, and then click on Watch Lists. You can name a watch list whatever you want, and in this case I made a watch list called Defense Stocks, and I put in my favorite ones in Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon. Fidelity has different views you can select to look at your watch list, like this basic view, which just shows the symbol and name along with basic price information. They also have a gain loss today view, which displays gain loss information for your position since last night's close. They also have views for mutual fund, which displays all of the mutual fund positions in your watch list, and a stock research view, which shows analyst recommendations, charts, and significant news for stocks in the watch list. You can also set up email or text alerts for your watch list stocks based on a bunch of criteria like price levels, percentage change, and moving averages. You can also flag a stock in your watch list as more important, which helps you with sorting and drawing your attention to it and such. Fidelity also has predefined watch lists in their various trader platforms. So like they have a futures watch list to see a variety of futures tickers. Yahoo Finance offers several watch lists like most active penny stocks and most shorted stocks and stuff like that. Anyways, I prefer to make my own watch list and spreadsheets, as then I can see more information that brokerage watch lists don't have, like payout ratios and dividend CAGRs and the number of consecutive years of dividend increases and such. Now, my personal watch list spreadsheet has a ton more information than this, but I simplified things down to just a few key metrics for this video. If you're customizing your own watch list, then include whatever you find useful. Like some people want to know if a company pays a dividend quarterly or monthly, so they might include that in their sheet. Some people might include knowing what months a company pays out their dividends, so they can try to smooth out getting some income every month. I always recommend not worrying too much about what month something pays out, because you can always just budget your dividends and receive them whatever you want, but that's just me. Some people like to include PEs in their watch lists, or price to book for banks, or etc. And I'll show you some more stocks after these defense ones. 
So why would someone like to invest in defense stocks? Well, as I mentioned in a video I did called Are Dividend Sin Stocks Bad For You? Some people love investing in big military defense companies, not just for financial reasons, but also because doing so can feel patriotic. Other people wouldn't dream of supporting companies that build weapons or fighter jets or etc. But I think that what's happening right now in the Ukraine is a big wake-up call that should cause you to reflect. Aren't you glad that dividend defense stocks like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies, General Dynamics, and North Grumman exist and are helping Ukraine defend itself? Or do you have a different perspective? Regardless, I think that the US military complex will continue to flourish for my lifetime and beyond. I read that the world spent over $2 trillion on militaries for the first time in 2021, an all-time high according to the latest data on global military expenditures. And the USA spends more than a bunch of other countries combined, and so where does large portions of that money go? Well, to these defense companies, which are now seeing even more defense spending than normal due to what's going on. A big risk defense stocks have is political, where a party in control can try to rein in spending. But hey, there's no sure thing, right? Okay, let's dive into some of the metrics on these defense stocks. First up is General Dynamics, ticker GD, an aerospace and defense company. Their primary customer is the Department of Defense, and they also sell internationally. They're also a big player in the luxury business jets vertical, with their well-known Gulfstream jets. Remember that song, Like a G6? Well, G6 is short for Gulfstream 650, which was a top-of-the-line General Dynamics jet when that song came out. But these days, ballers have upgraded to the G8, aka G800. GD also builds the Abrams battle tank, as well as missiles, rockets, submarines, jets, and the list goes on and on. GD is currently trading at 227, and I calculated that its fair price is at 185, and my good price is a 50% margin of safety for my fair price, and in this case, that would be at 157. Or to say that differently, I think GD is too pricey right now, but hey, their future looks bright, so maybe they could keep trending up even though I calculate they're too expensive. I then list the 5-year stock compound annual growth rate, aka their 5-year stock CAGR, and I got these numbers from Portfolio Visualizer, and this includes stock appreciation plus dividends reinvested. What we see is that GD returned 8.63% per year total return over the last 5 years, and you can compare that to VTI, which I list in the bottom of the spreadsheet, which returned 8.68% per year, aka comparable performance. I also list the 20-year stock annualized total return, and for GD we see that they returned an awesome 11.41% per year, as compared to VTI which did 8.29%. That's pretty amazing to materially beat the overall US market in annualized returns like that. GD has an awesome 28 consecutive years of dividend increases, and is recognized as an official dividend aristocrat. It has a 2.14% yield, a 8.45% 5 year dividend CAGR. I then include a field where I add up yield and CAGR up as a simple comparison field, and in this case GD is at a combined 10.59%, and it's got a nice low payout ratio at 41.38%. And a quick note, I'm actually okay to DCA into VTI whenever, but my okay price for VTI represents about a 15 PE, which means the market is about 20% overpriced relative to historic trends right now, and my good price represents a 15% discount to that 15 PE. Okay, let's move on. Next up we have another favorite in Lockheed Martin, ticker LMT. They build many products you'd recognize, from ocean destroyers, to Blackhawks and Apache helicopters, to F-16 jets along with F-22s, F-35s, and a slew of others. Lockheed is currently trading at 454, and my OK price for them is 350, though given the state of the world it's probably unrealistic to see them get that low, unless something material happens, but regardless my good price for them is 298. LMT's 5 year stock CAGR is an awesome 14.72%. Its 20-year stock CAGR is just amazing at 14.77%. That's truly incredible. LMT has a great 20 consecutive years of dividend increases, a 2.67% yield, an 8.85% five-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of 11.52%. Nice. It's also got a great low payout ratio of 41.68%. Next, we have another powerhouse in Northrop Grumman, ticker NOC. They built some of the world's most advanced aircraft like the famous B-2 stealth bomber, and I've worked with Lockheed Martin on multiple of the F-jets. They also build naval warfare systems, missiles, warheads, radar, and a slew of other things. NOC is currently trading at 463, and my OK price for them is 375, and my good price is 319. NOC's 5-year stock CAGR is at an amazing 17%. Wow. Its 20-year stock CAGR is also beyond belief at 14.93%. That means over the last 20 years, including reinvesting dividends, NOC has been averaging a 14.93% total return, all of which is way more than the overall market. 
but I guess that makes sense if you think of all the conflicts the US has been in around the world. NOC has a good 17 consecutive years of dividend increases, a low 1.51% yield, a grade 11.63% five-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of 13.14%. It's also got a great low payer ratio of 27%. Okay, now let's move on to Raytheon Tech Corp. These guys have tons of products you've heard of as well. I'm talking about things like Tomahawk and Stinger cruise missiles, the Iron Dome defense systems, radars, the Aegis system, and a lot more. RTX is currently trading at $100, and my okay price for them is $100, and my good price is $85. RTX 5-year stock category is at 9.1%, slightly underperforming LMT and NOC, but beating General Dynamics. Raytheon's 20-year stock category is at 10.29%, handily beating the market, though underperforming the other defense stocks in this list. RTX's number of consecutive years of dividend increases isn't totally obvious to me. In 2020, Raytheon Core merged with United Technologies Core to officially form Raytheon Technologies Core, though in 2021, Raytheon was removed from the dividend aristocrat list. Seeking Alpha still lists Raytheon Tech as having 29 consecutive years of dividend increases, so either way they have been a strong and serious dividend payer, even if they failed to meet the formal dividend aristocrat methodology due to the merger. RTX is a 2.2% yield, a weak 4.76% five-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of 6.97%, and a low payout ratio of 46%. Now I like each of these defense stocks for different reasons, though Lockheed and Northrop are the ones that I'm personally most compelled with. My guess is all these guys will do well over the long term. Okay, let's move on. Now let's take a look at the last key stocks I'm looking closer at, those being Canadian banks, which are respected as potentially some of the best in the world. I think Canada the country is a great long-term future, though like the US they run the risk of printing too much money. They have a strong education system, essentially free healthcare, and a vast geography with natural resources. But they also have the fourth highest household debt to income in the world per trading economics. And Canada's household debt to GDP is the fourth highest in the world. And then if you look over the last 25 years, you can see how it's progressively gotten worse other than recently where it started trending down. And I show you this to highlight that everything has risks. I've not been a big fan of financials since the financial crisis, and I'm concerned about investing in financials given the state of world economics right now. But remember, the people who really make money are the ones who take intelligent risks. Anyways, an annoyance to investing in dividend stocks outside your home country is that your dividend payments can fluctuate a lot due to currency changes. Another aspect of angst is that if I held Canadian stocks in my taxable account, then I'd need to deal with Canadian withholding taxes. To get around that, I'd hold the banks in my retirement accounts. Bottom line, Canadian banks seem to hold strong levels of capital above regulatory requirements, thus I think they could hold through a tough country recession. They also have strong risk management practices and engage in solid underwriting, all of which should help them navigate things if the S hits the fan. And each bank in Canada has its own areas of strengths and focus areas, but for brevity's sake I'll just keep this short. Let's start this list with Bank of Montreal, one of the big five banks of Canada. Canadian banks have some of the richest histories of paying out dividends in the world, and BMO has been paying out since 1829, i.e. for almost 200 years. But I couldn't find good data on how many consecutive years they've increased their dividend, though you can tell it's been trending up for decades. BMO is currently trading at $100, and my okay price for them is $100, and my good price is $85. BMO's 5-year stock CAGR is at 6.2%, underperforming the overall market. BMO's 20-year stock category is at 11.42%, nicely outperforming the overall market. Bank of Montreal has a great 4.2% yield, a good 8.87% five-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of over 13%, along with a nice low payout ratio of 39%. The next bank on the list is Royal Bank of Canada, a dividend payer since 1870. ROI is currently trading at $100 US, which also means it's trading at $133 Canadian dollars. If you type in ticker NYSE colon RY, you'll get it in US dollars, or ticker TSE colon RY for the Canadian exchange. TSE stands for Toronto Stock Exchange. It's always important to know what currency someone is talking in, so you can have the right context to understand what they're talking about. Like my portfolio yields around $92,800 a year in dividends in US dollars, but it would make $124,000 a year in Canadian dollars. Anyways, my OK price for them is 100 US dollars, and my good price is $85. ROI's 5-year stock CAGR is at 8.36%, about matching the overall market. ROI's 20-year stock CAGR is at 11.91%, nicely outperforming the overall market. Royal Bank of Canada has a decent 3.79% yield, an OK 6.78% 5-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of 10.57%, along with a nice low payout ratio of 42%. 
And now last up is Toronto Dominion Bank, ticker TD, a dividend payer since 1857. TD is currently trading at $67, which I feel is a nice price for them. TD's 5-year stock CAGR is at 6.22%, underperforming VTI. But its 20-year stock CAGR is at 12.19%, nicely beating the overall market. So like most things, it matters when you invest. TD has a nice 4.09% yield, a good 7.98% 5-year dividend CAGR, and a combined yield plus CAGR of 12.07%, along with a nice low payout ratio of 40%. Okay, those are the main stocks on my watch list, though there are some material stocks and semiconductor stocks I'm also keeping an eye on. And to close things off, I want to show you some comments from people that I felt were a bit cynical and or angry, and I thought would be helpful to respond to publicly. The first is from Jay, and he said, I wonder if anyone watching YouTube has $2 million to invest so they can live off dividends. He left that comment on my video called My $2.67 million Dividend Portfolio, $90,000 of Dividends Per Year. So Jay, my channel is meant to teach people how they can get rich slowly, where if they keep investing in quality stocks for decades, then they too will have an awesome passive income stream. Whereas many finance channels on YouTube are for people starting out their investing journeys, I represent someone who's been on the path for a decent amount of time, and so I can share the steps I took to achieve my wealth. I get zero excitement or motivation about flexing my portfolio over YouTube, but what does jazz me up is knowing that I'm helping people learn about investing, about how to make your money work for you, about how to make passive income, all of which is game-changing for your mental and financial health. So it doesn't matter if you build a million dollar portfolio or whatever, what matters is if you invest intelligently. Make sense? Okay, let's move on. The next comment came on my most popular video ever, the one I did a few months ago called What I Learned Living on Dividends for Two Years. It came from Ed who said, He retired in his 40s and started investing 30 years ago? Just unsubscribe this BS. Okay, Ed, let's see if I can clarify some things for you, even though apparently you won't be watching this video. I'll start by sharing some quotes from that video you commented on. So I said, I just hit my two year anniversary of retiring in my 40s due to dividends paying all my bills, end quote. AKA I retired two years ago, and since I did that video at the end of 2022, that means I retired around the end of 2020. Now if you're a longtime subscriber, you'd already know that I retired back in 2020, because I did a video called Huge Dividend News about my portfolio, where I talked about how I finally turned off my drip and was no longer taking a salary at a job, and instead of spending my time working on my YouTube channel, as well as helping my wife start doing some online stuff, and how I was helping out a private startup for equity rather than a salary. That startup is still moving forward, but it's a super long shot whether my shares in it will ever amount to anything. My dividends cover all my bills, and then YouTube and anything else is just gravy. YouTube's neat not just because I know I'm helping a bunch of people, but also because I can show my kids how to start a business from scratch. Anyways, the next thing I'll quote was when I said, The TLDR in my background is that I've been investing in the stock market for almost 30 years, which means through the dot-com crash and the 2008 financial crisis, and I'm someone who is very passionate about dividend investing. I've never been given a dime nor won a lottery and instead just kept investing since the day I graduated college in the 90s and got a job as a programmer." End quote. So to restate that, I graduated from college in the 90s and I started investing right when I graduated and when I did that video three months ago I said I've been investing in the stock market for almost 30 years. Okay, so almost 30 years probably means 28 or 29 years and most people graduate from college when they're about 21 years old, thus that probably means I'm around 50 years old. I said I retired in my 40s, aka between 41 to 49 years old, and since you know I retired a little over two years ago, we end up with me retiring in my upper 40s. Now my guess is that you didn't reflect on what I said and you inaccurately concluded that if you retired at 40 and he's been investing for 30 years, that means he started investing at age 10? BS. Regardless, my suggestion for you, Ed, is to simply ask clarifying questions if something is said in a video that doesn't make sense to you, rather than rage quit. If you ask in a mature manner, I'll answer, because as most people know, I try to respond to every comment I'm asked. Of course, if someone acts like an ass in my comments, then I may not answer, and I may ban people who I feel are too toxic. Which reminds me, if you leave a comment and I don't respond to it, then that could mean that you've been banned by me. It's also possible that I didn't answer if your comment went into YouTube's spam section, which I don't routinely check. I have my comment section set at the highest security level YouTube allows, and it turns out certain things automatically go into spam, like if you include a URL or a hashtag in your comment, or if you use words that are on a banned list. Like I have some crypto coins that I put on my banned word list when I was getting tons of crypto scammers posting on my vids. 99% of my bans are fake bot advertising comments, however I have accidentally banned people in the past. Like it's not uncommon for me to get daily spam comments about some awesome stock investor, and then the scammers have bots which then post a bunch of fake responses to the original comment under different usernames, agreeing with the original comment or asking for more info like how to contact them or whatever. What I do is go person by person and ban the dozens of fake accounts that responded to the original fake comment, 
but once in a blue moon a real person might respond saying it's a fake threat or trying to say something funny, and in my haste to not spend literal hours banning, I may accidentally ban them as well. The reason I ban all the fake accounts is because I want to minimize them doing more damage on my other videos, even though just removing or banning the original comment would be the most expedient. Another reason I ban people is if they threaten me or another user, and when that happens I report them to YouTube and ban them. Unfortunately that's happened to me. Anyways, if you leave a comment and I don't respond to you, and you haven't done anything nasty, then that means I probably banned you accidentally, or you auto went into the YouTube spam folder. If you care enough, then just email me and tell me your YouTube username, and I'll see if you are put on the ban list. Now, if you've been watching my videos for a while, then you know I'm pretty private about things. Why is that? Well, because none of my friends or family members, outside of my wife and kids, know that I have a YouTube channel. Staying private lets me feel okay to share stuff about my relatives in my videos that I'd otherwise not be comfortable sharing. Plus, I like the fact that none of my friends or relatives know that I'm a multimillionaire because I don't want that to influence their interactions with me. Obviously, great friends and family members want to treat you differently, but I prefer to just avoid the situation. Finally, I like to stay private because I want to minimize the chance of some crazy person trying to use my wealth against me. Yes, I'm probably more cautious than I need to be, but that makes me sleep well at night. Okay, and one final comment, and this one is from Ken, who said, 2.6 million and you're only making 90k a year in divs? That sucks! Comments like that usually come from newer investors, who usually say stuff like they make way more yield in QYLD, or that if I were smarter I could be 100% in a couple high risk stocks, or stuff like that. Had Ken taken the time to watch more videos, he would see that I've purposefully crafted a portfolio that covers my bills, but also has growth in it. Like my largest position in my portfolio is also my lowest yielding one in Apple, which only has a 0.65% yield. Why is it my largest? Well, it's shot up hundreds of percent since the time I got in, and I think it has room to keep running. Now if I didn't have enough dividends to cover my expenses, then I would sell out of some of my lower yield stuff to get into decent higher yield stuff. But at this point I've not needed to do that. So I explained to Ken that my portfolio is generating the income that I need, aka more than I spend, and my portfolio allows me to remain in higher growth lower yield stuff, which over the long run should appreciate more than just high yield stuff. I explained how my income is crafted to a level that meets my goals and needs, while still being a diverse portfolio that minimizes my losses in down markets. I explained how I just did a video that showed it that my portfolio was basically flat in 2022, even though the market lost 20%, and that it would be easy for me to go into a bunch of high yield stocks if I just wanted income, but doing so wouldn't achieve other goals I had. Bottom line, I suggested to keep watching and learning, and as he becomes more versed in dividend investing, then things like what I'm doing would make more sense. And oftentimes new investors will tunnel vision on what's happening in the present. Like they'll say, you should sell everything and just go into short term bonds, because they just saw some bond was yielding 8% or something. Anyways, Ken raged a bit and then he said some inflammatory things and he ended up deleting most of his comments. My advice to Ken and everyone is try to leave nice comments on videos or leave nothing at all. It's often people who are depressed or angry or stressed that tend to leave nasty comments and if that's you then you can rewire your brain to be happier. Like do more exercise as that has been proven to help increase your happiness amongst a slew of other positive benefits. Science has shown us that exercise increases your serotonin which is also called the happiness chemical as it positively affects your mood, learning, memory, and of course happiness amongst other things. Laughing releases serotonin, so maybe go watch some funny YouTube videos. Exercise also helps increase your levels of oxytocin, which can help with anti-stress type effects like reducing your blood pressure. Oxytocin is also called the love hormone because cuddling, giving someone a nice massage, making love, or even a nice long hug all leads to higher levels of oxytocin. So the next time you're in a bar and you see a hottie, just tell them that you'd love to increase your oxytocin with them. If that pickup line doesn't work, nothing will. A final way that helps increase your oxytocin is seeing cute cuddly things, so go watch YouTube puppy videos or kitty videos. Low levels of oxytocin in the brain are associated with several mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, social phobia, and others. So instead of leaving a mean comment on a video, try to find something you liked and comment about that. Expressing gratitude increases your dopamine, which is also known as the reward chemical, which is also what you get when you accomplish something or you're excited or when you get a reward. You can also increase your dopamine by thinking about things you're grateful for. Maybe that cozy sweatshirt you're wearing or the fact that the sun is shining outside or that your pet is awesome. Anything simple works. So exercising, eating, having sex, getting a massage and other things all boost your endorphins, which reduce your stress and improve your mood. Work on being happier and finding something nice to say will help you feel happier. Internet trolls who leave mean comments are unfortunately digging themselves deeper into holes of depression and stress and anxiety. You can change. You can rewire your brain. Just remember the acronym DOS, which are your brain's happy chemicals, which stand for dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Bottom line, don't jump to quick conclusions based on limited data, especially about people. 
It reminds me of the story about an elementary school teacher named Mrs. Thompson. As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Miss Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy and that he constantly needed a bath. Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson could actually take delight in marking his papers with a bright red pen and making bold X's and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records and she put her Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and he has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and his life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy's withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes he even sleeps in class. By now, Miss Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in a heavy brown paper bag that he got from the grocery store. Miss Thompson took pains to open Teddy's present in the middle of class. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was a quarter full of perfume. But she stifled her children's laughter when she explained how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. The point of that story? Never jump to conclusions or judge people. Or you can forget all that and just invest in quality dividend stocks and you'll get cash and happiness win-win. And with that, I'd like to shout out my newest Patreon aristocrats who have signed up since my last video. And we have quite a few as I've opened up a bunch of seats. So thank yous go out to Jason M, Iron Knight, Clevy Mobile, Tad P, PS2925, Jazz, Jesse, Wacko, J. Gibb, Uncanny, and Shoot First Games. I'd also like to thank Jazz Edge, who upgraded for an entire year, giving him a 10% discount. Some other people who signed up for an entire year were Jonathan P, Dan B, Brian P, Kep89, Juan Pham, and Ada the Traveler, who has a YouTube channel about her travels in Latin America. She has videos about the cost of living, sightseeing spots, cultural events, food, and lots of other neat things. I'll include a link to her channel in the description below. I'd also like to call out RY Killer, who recently boosted my Discord. Riskrats gained access to my dividend portfolio tracker spreadsheet, which I use in lots of my videos, and they get special access to various private channels on my Discord, including one which lets you watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as lets you vote on which thumbnails I should use. And of course you get more direct access to me. They also get a shout out as you just heard, and I add them to my scrolling news stickers on my videos. Finally, I urge everyone to join my free dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of dividend investors on it from around the world. Regardless of what you do, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.